Okay, dann würden wir anfangen. Guten Abend und äh, herzlich willkommen im Namen der Deutsch-Israelischen Gesellschaft Bremen-Unterweser. Herzlich willkommen auch Fania aus Salzberger, die gerade auf kleiner Deutschland-Reise oder Tournee ist und heute in Bremen ist und darüber freuen wir uns sehr. Sie war das letzte Mal vor 15 Jahren in Bremen, hat sie mir erzählt, und wird heute über die äh, aktuelle Demokratiebewegung in Israel sprechen, die seit äh, 23 Wochen inzwischen auf die Straße geht. Und sie wird uns erklären, ähm, wo die Bewegung aktuell steht, wo sie hin will und auch Vergleiche ziehen zur, äh, zwischen der Situation in Israel und der Situation beispielsweise in Ungarn oder anderen äh, inzwischen also ich kann schon. Ich meinem 80-jährigen Ohr liegen. Aber irgendwie. Äh, ja, ich, okay, dann rede ich noch ein bisschen lauter. Noch näher dran. Ähm, ja, Fania aus Salzberger wird heute über die Demokratiebewegungen in Israel sprechen und uns einen Kontext liefern, wo diese Bewegung steht aktuell, nachdem sie schon 23 Wochen auf der Straße ist, wo sie hin will und was so ähm, Szenarien sind, die ähm, demnächst eintreten können. Und sie wird auch die Entwicklung in Israel vergleichen mit Entwicklungen in anderen Ländern, wo es auch sehr starke, autoritäre, illiberale Kräfte gibt. Frau aus Salzberger ist selber in der besagten Demokratiebewegung aktiv. Sie ist Professorin an der Universität Haifa und hat im Surkamp Verlag zwei Bücher publiziert, die Ihnen oder Euch vielleicht bekannt sind. 2009 das Buch Israelis in Berlin und 2013 zusammen mit ihrem Vater Amos Oz Juden und Worte. Und äh, den heutigen Abend bestreiten wir auch mit der äh, Unterstützung der Heinrich Böll Stiftung. Vielen Dank dafür. Und äh, Fania wird auf Englisch sprechen. Wenn es aber das Bedürfnis gibt, konsekutiv auf Deutsch zu übersetzen, mache ich das gerne. Da bitte ich aber vorab um ein ehrliches Signal, ob das nötig ist, ähm, weil wir dann entsprechend den Vortrag ein bisschen kompakter machen, wenn ich dann immer mal wieder zusammenfasse. Deswegen wäre es nett, wenn Sie, wenn ihr kurz ein Signal gibt, ob das gewünscht ist, dass ich ein bisschen übersetze oder ob wir komplett auf Englisch machen können. English. What do you think? Okay, so, so we'll give it a try uh, in English and in case something doesn't work, just raise your hand and let me know. And so I pass the mic over to you, Fania. Uh, the floor is yours and we're curious to hear your presentation. It will last around 45 minutes and after that we will have the chance to have some questions and answer and feel free to ask whatever you want. Uh, we will get a nice discussion. Thank you. Guten Abend, danke schön, Till. Danke äh, auch an Hermann Kuhn für diese äh, Invitation. Ich konnte auch ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen, aber leider ist mein Englisch viel besser als mein Deutsch. So wir probieren äh, in Englisch äh, jetzt. Äh, thank you very much for coming this evening. I, yes, of course, and I will also speak closer to the microphone. Können Sie jetzt äh, gut hören? Ja, geht es? Gut, okay, okay. I will stick to the microphone. Um, I understand that many of you are already acquainted with the situation, the general situation in Israel, and I need not go into all the details of what happened since January until today, but I will give you some of the news of the last uh, days. And also, uh, I need to set up my own, as still already uh, mentioned, my own uh, place. Uh, I am with the pro-democracy movement in Israel. The protest movement, which has become more than a protest movement, it is now a movement offering also creative ideas for the future of Israel being aware that part of the problem, a deep part of the problem, is that we don't have a written constitution, a strong constitution. And some of us are now sitting and trying to write principles, perhaps the minimum principles, for a constitution for the state of Israel. Because we are facing a situation in which one power, the government, has become very strong, the second power, the parliament, is weak and obeying the government virtually in everything, and the third power, 
the judiciary that has so far been independent is under threat. So this is not just an academic paper. I'm here to call for your attention, for your sympathy, perhaps for your support, because we, and when I say we, I mean Israeli civil society, the part of civil society which is the pro-democracy movement, needs the attention and the support of all its friends abroad. Um, I will be talking about the protest and how it is organized. But as you know, we Israelis are not a very organized nation, <laughs> except when it's really necessary. <laughs> and this movement has organized itself very beautifully from the roots up, from the grassroots in cities, in towns, in villages, up and down the country. Geographically, it's very widespread. But the biggest demonstration, as you probably know, is in Tel Aviv, and then in Jerusalem, and then all over the place. But there are also, I will be talking about it, groups that organize themselves within the protest movement. And I belong to several of those groups. For example, I belong to the women's protest. The women have a lot to lose in their status and equality uh, with the forthcoming threatened legislation. I also belong to the academics movement. I help the law professors group, although I'm not a law professor but a historian. And there is even the poets and writers group. And we do good things uh, among the poets and the writers. I consider what is called a judicial uh, reform or overall by the government of Israel under Benjamin Netanyahu to be no less than a coup, coup d'etat, as they call it in French. And in German, it is called, excuse me for the expression, a putsch, a putsch from above, from the government itself, attempting no less than a change in Israel's form of government from a liberal democracy, although I admit it is a flawed, a partial liberal democracy, but still within Israel, not in the Palestinian territories, but within Israel, it has been a very vibrant and healthy democracy until recently. To change the regime from a liberal democracy into, in the movement we call it dictatorship, but we can call it also an autocracy based on the example of Viktor Orban's government in Hungary and based on the situation in Poland. The Israeli government and Netanyahu and his close circle leading this coup d'etat, this putsch, are learning the lessons of Hungary and Poland to some degree also Turkey and India, but I think Hungary and Poland are the best examples. Except that Israel is much more complicated than Hungary and Poland, for better and for worse. For better because, as we will see, we have a very strong civil society, surprisingly strong, I am surprised myself. <laughs> And for worse, because we have the ongoing situation of the occupation of the Palestinian territories, the Jewish-Arab sensitivities within the state of Israel, and also conflict lines between the ultra-religious, the ultra-orthodox, and the secular, the nationalists and the liberals, and to some degree in Jewish society, the Ashkenazis and the Sephardis, or Mizrahi. Everybody knows about Ashkenazi Sephardi. So this is, for example, a fault line that has not been very problematic until about 25 years ago, but under Netanyahu's regime, it has become increasingly used in the rhetoric of the right wing. That is, even before the current development, there has been a very organized campaign against the kind of Israel that I 
represent, that I and my friends represent. We are called Ashkenazi, elitist. Of course, not all of us are Ashkenazi and not all of us are elitist at all. Left wing, extreme left, and when they wish, they also call us traitors. No less than that. This rhetoric has been going on, I will be talking about it. And into this strain comes a Viktor Orban style putsch from above. With the main enemy focused as the Supreme Court and the Attorney General of Israel. What has happened? The elections took place in November, as you know. The government was set up in December and in early January, Minister of uh, Justice, we call him the Minister of Injustice, Yariv Levin, has announced a thorough and detailed, what he calls, legal reform. It is not a legal reform, it is a change in the balance of powers intended to silence the Supreme Court's review of laws legislated by the Knesset and also, this is less well known, of decisions made by the government. So there are two levels here. The Supreme Court is entitled to review Knesset legislation and decisions of the government if they are extremely unreasonable and to strike them down. If the legislation goes through, the Supreme Court will no longer be able to strike down extremist legislation or unreasonable decisions of the government. For example, appointing very unsuitable and unfitting and sometimes corrupt people as officials in different roles in the government and in the judiciary. This legislation is only the outside envelope of the essential plan of this government. And the essential plan of this government is to remove equality between citizens and citizens, between Jews and Arabs in Israel, full citizens, but this government wants the Arabs to have fewer civil rights, between men and women, it goes that far with the ultra-nationalists and the ultra-orthodox, between straights and LGBTQ, gays and lesbians, and other minority groups. This is the essence. The judicial revolution is meant to enable the government to move into the essential anti-equality, illiberal legislation. This is the Hungary and Poland protocol. And this protocol the government has been following since January. What the government did not expect is the immediate, very quick rise of an enormously large protest movement. I will be talking about it shortly. Incorporating at its height half a million people in the street. And we are calculating that around two million Israelis, adults and young people, also teenagers, are taking some part in this pro-democracy movement. When I say two million, I'm saying one-fifth of the population of the country. This is staggering. It is stunning. It is unprecedented in any other protest movement in the democratic world. This is part of the good news, and I will be conveying good news and bad news today. 
But what has happened in the meantime? So very briefly, as you know, the protest movement was quick to organize and quick to understand what's going on. And here you have the role of the intellectuals or academia. People tend to laugh at intellectuals and academics nowadays. But sometimes we still need intellectuals and academics, you know. Because very quickly, the lawyers, the law professors, the political science professors, the historians like myself, created clear explanations of this complicated legal matter for the public to read and to understand, for anyone who is interested. And people read and understood. It is very different from cases such as, we talked about it before, till the Arab Spring, which was a spontaneous movement of many thousands of individuals, but unorganized and without the tools to keep going for a long time. It is also very different from Hungary and Poland, where there was some protest on the street, but a lot of people, and especially young people, stayed at home because they didn't follow exactly the news and it sounded very technical and it sounded very bureaucratic and they didn't wake up until it was too late. Not in Israel. The number of men and women and young people who grasped and understood the danger for democracy is very, very large. Um, and yet, the protest managed to halt, to put a temporary stop to the legislation when some of the laws were already in the Knesset for what we call the third reading. The third reading is the final reading. So they were stopped before the third reading because people were out in the street and we were demonstrating outside the Knesset and Netanyahu, who is a well-known coward sometimes when it fits him, stopped the legislation for a while so that the coalition and the opposition can have talks in the president's house. President Yitzhak Herzog served with me in the Israeli army, so I have known him for many years. These talks have been going on with very little information since March until a week ago. Now, the protesters, the people out on the streets, the organizations, the groups are not represented in this negotiation. Only coalition members and opposition members. The opposition is supposed to represent uh, the protest movement, but the opposition leaders, Mr. Gantz and Mr. Lapid, centrists, are, in our view, much too weak and soft-spoken vis-a-vis Netanyahu and his, forgive the expression, gang. Uh, I am not a scaremonger. I am not easily frightened. I have lived through two major wars and some minor wars and terrible terrorist attacks and many crises, <laughs> political and human. And I've always remained an optimist and hopeful about the future of Israel and, by the way, also the future of Palestine. I believed, I still believe, that an agreement will and can be reached. However, right now, this moment is different from all the previous moments. Because so far, Israeli politics has played out I didn't always like the results, but it played out according to, a certain, to certain rules of the game. Now the rules of the game are under attack. This is a new situation. And so, yes, I am scared, I am frightened, I am worried, and I feel that friends of Israel, true friends of Israel, should be worried, very worried, by the situation but also heartened by the response of the Israeli public. Uh, I would quickly put 
uh, to you six points that make this moment, this situation very, very special, very unique, unprecedented in Israeli history. And then we will move to talk about the democracy movement. And I will tell you some of the news about it. First of all, this government is the most extreme right, nationalist, theocratic government in the history of Israel. We always had nationalist and ultra-Orthodox parties playing the political game. Very often they were represented in the government, but it was always in coalition with the left or at least with the center. This is the first government, which is a coalition in which Likud and Mr. Netanyahu are the most left-wing part, which is a crazy situation. Also to Netanyahu himself. Right of Netanyahu, we have the ultra-nationalist party, Jewish power, even the name makes me tremble, which is openly, proudly racist, anti-Arab, anti-Palestinian, and also hold extreme views about the role of women. Women should be ideally in the house making children. And these are the nationalists. We haven't reached the ultra-Orthodox yet. <laughs> For example, they oppose the equal service of women and men in the army. They want the women to go home because the military is an affair for men and not for women. Because the women, they say, make the Israeli army weaker. Because they are feminine, you know. Well, the women in the protest movement, I can tell you, are not weak at all. Then we have the ultra-Orthodox, who share many of the ultra-nationalist position about liberalism, despise liberalism, look down on secular Israelis like me as not Jewish enough, and of course mainly wish to be left alone, they have privileges, their sons do not, daughters of course, don't serve in the army at all, and they get very generous budgets for keeping their own autonomous education system, which does not teach core subjects. It's hard to believe in the modern world, it's hard to believe in the high-tech nation that Israel has become, that we have hundreds of thousands of ultra-Orthodox students, of course, boys and girls completely separate. The girls learn a little more than the boys. The boys learn almost only Jewish religious topics. There is no mathematics, no English, no other languages, no history, no geography, certainly not literature, nothing. And it's been going on, and of course now they are getting even more money for this other universe education system. A totally parallel universe. And of course, their education system, system has raised generations of ignorant men and women who are totally reliant for their voting patterns, for example, on rabbis and party leaders. Although we are hearing interesting noises from there, but I don't know how that will develop. So far, it is an enormous part of society, 15% going on 20%, and of course they have very large families, so their demography is growing year by year, who are outside the democratic game, not just illiberal, but not very interested in democracy itself except that it's fine as long as it pays for their own lifestyle. This is the first unique situation. Secondly, and I will be very quick about it, illiberal laws are in the pipeline. The purpose of the judicial overhaul, as I say, is to legislate, for example, for gender separation in the public sphere. So in public events, to create half a room for women, half a room for men. Also in events paid for by the public, which is, so far has been illegal. 
By the way, when I say women on one side, men on the other side of the room in such events, it's usually not this. It's women in the back and men in the front. When we ask why are women in the back, they want this to be on buses as well, by the way, in areas in which there is an ultra-Orthodox population. We say, wait a minute, okay, suppose you want to have a gender separation bad enough, but why are the women in the back of the bus or the room? Why not put the men in the back of the bus or the room? I say, oh, you don't understand. We, our intentions are very pure. It is only when men look at women, they have evil thoughts. So if the men are in the back, they will see the backs of the women. This can't work, you know, the men mustn't look at women at all. So let's put the women in the back. This is one kind of legislation. Another sort of legislation, which is already in the books, already getting prepared to be put on the table of the Knesset, is a legislation that would demand Arab citizens of Israel, Arab citizens of Israel, not the Palestinians under occupation, but the citizens of Israel, we have about 18 to 20 percent Arab citizens, full citizens with full rights, to demand that they declare their loyalty in declaration or in writing, in signing, loyalty to Israel as a Jewish state, and only then will they have permission to be elected to the Knesset or to vote for the Knesset. I don't have to tell you what kind of a law that is. And it's already on the table. Now, obviously, the Supreme Court, as it stands today, would overturn each of these laws as being unconstitutional. Now, we don't have a written constitution, but we have basic laws. And the basic laws talk about human rights, about civil equality. We also have a wonderful document called the Declaration of Independence, which was written and declared in Ben-Gurion's own voice in Tel Aviv during the War of Independence in 19, May 1948. And this declaration, I will return to it, puts together the best part of the Zionist movement, which is the part that heads back to the Enlightenment, the Aufklärung, and the Jewish Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment. Now, the Supreme Court has, at present, still has, the authority to strike down laws that contradict these principles of equality between citizens, equality between human beings. It will not have this power if the so-called judicial overhaul will go through. And therefore, Netanyahu and his partners have started moving the legislation. Now, the legislation was halted, as I told you, until a week ago. The dramatic elements that took place in the last week was that Netanyahu had promised the opposition leaders promised upon his honor, but he always promises upon his honor. To <laughs> I didn't say that, <laughs> but he promised upon his honor that uh, the committee for the election of new ju judges will be elected and convened. You cannot elect new judges in Israel without first approving a committee that will elect all the judges on all the levels, from the Supreme Court down to the most basic courts. This committee, and here I will go into quick detail, and I think you already know it, is made up of nine people, three judges, two government ministers, two Knesset members, traditionally one from the coalition and one from the opposition, and two members of the Bar Association. And so far it has been a very professional committee, and it usually chose excellent judges on all levels, and it has been um, hailed and, and uh, lauded by many experts around the world. This bar? Bar Association, um, the lawyers, the lawyers' association. What is this in Deutsch? Anwaltsvereinigung or Anwaltskammer? Anwaltskammer, Anwaltskammer, yeah. 
Uh, now, this is the big drama because the government is looking for different ways to take over this committee, to politicize it, to make it obedient to the current coalition government, and therefore it will elect judges that will also presumably be obedient to the current government. So first they tried to take over the Anwaltkammer, and we had elections just the day before yesterday, and Netanyahu's candidate lost by 70% to the candidate who is pro-democracy. So the Anwaltkammer will send representatives to the committee who are pro-democracy, and they will elect judges according to merit and not according to politics. So now there is a new law on the table to change the committee. And that the Anwaltkammer, the uh, uh, Bar Association, will no longer sit on the committee because it has been taken over by the liberal left. You see how this is moving in zigzag, trying to achieve the end uh, in any uh, means. Uh, and the committee has not yet been chosen because Netanyahu conducted some trick in the Knesset last week. And this is why the opposition said, enough is enough, we are stopping the talks in the president's house. To which the justice of minister and most of the Likud members responded, fine, so we are going on with the judicial overhaul. The second law that is now on the table of the Knesset, and they want to do it next week, to legislate this law, will prevent from the Supreme Court a review, not yet of Knesset legislation, this will come later, but of government decisions. So if the government makes a decision which is wildly unreasonable, the court will not be able to use its power to strike down this decision. It's called the clause of reasonableness, and we inherited it from the British mandate. What is an unreasonable government decision? For example, to appoint Mr. Netanyahu's son and heir, Yair Netanyahu, who is very active in the coup d'etat, very active in the social networks, to appoint him to some official role, perhaps a minister, perhaps even a judge, because the kid went to law school. And the court would be able to do nothing about it. And this is coming next week. So we are now in a big reawakening of the protest and the grave concern for the future of Israeli democracy. Uh, I will add, this is already my fifth point of the uniqueness of Israel. Now, Israel is not the only country in the world with unique politicians among its leaders. But we have the very special case of Mr. Netanyahu currently on trial he was indicted, that is, put on trial uh, four years ago, in 2019, on three charges of corruption and breach of trust. Basically, he bribed newspapers to write good stories about him, and especially about his wife, Sarah. He made sure that certain billionaires by giving them all sorts of concessions for their business, for their industry, and so on, will bring expensive uh, presents, gifts, to him and to his wife. He loves cigars, Cuban cigars, and Mrs. Netanyahu, I don't know why, but she loves pink champagne. I think this is bad taste, but I'm not uh, criticizing pink champagne. I am criticizing the fact that they receives, received hundreds of crates of champagne and cigars from some of the leading businessmen in the country. And there are other charges of bribery and tr breach of trust against Netanyahu. Now he, of course, says that the whole thing is very democratic, the Supreme Court has become too strong. He wants to weaken the Supreme Court in order to create a better balance of the three powers. And using this rhetoric, he does not deny when his own followers tell us 
that this will affect his trial and get him off the hook. Because by the time the cases against Netanyahu will reach, and they will reach, the Supreme Court could take years. We don't know. But by the time they reach the Supreme Court, hopefully for Netanyahu, the Supreme Court will, be, will have a personnel that is obedient to Netanyahu's government. That's the idea. Now you could say, and some of the Likud people say, but this is democratic, we had elections, we have a majority, a small majority, but a majority, 64 in the coalition, out of 120 Knesset members. Wait until, wait patiently until the next elections, and then you can have your say. Democracies are decided by elections, they say. And we say yes, but not only. Because if it were only elections, it would not be a democracy, it would be a tyranny of the majority, which is going to happen now. Furthermore, if the legislation comes through, the liberals, the left and center, will no longer have a chance to win the elections. Because without our Arab partners, if the Arab parties are not allowed to, to campaign and to compete and to run to the Knesset, there is very little chance that the center-left would ever have a majority. So from now on, we shall have right-wing, extreme right-wing governments, ultra-Orthodox, theocratic nationalist governments. And of course, with the change in the Supreme Court, Netanyahu might just win his legal cases and walk off free. These are the uniquenesses of the Israeli case. But the worst part, and this is not unique to Israel, but it's very strong in Israel, is the poisoning of the public conversation. The poisoning of the public sphere. For years now, Netanyahu and his people, and he has a very strong ring of advisors, some of them formal, some of them informal. His own son, Yair, is leading this pack. Some of them are journalists. Some of them pretend to be journalists, but they're actually only mouthpieces of Netanyahu. The word we use for it now in Israeli discussion is shofars. Everybody knows what's a shofar? Do, 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 do. In the Jewish holidays, beautiful thing made of a horn, a beautiful word, and now this word has been, unfortunately, uh, used in order to call these cronies of Netanyahu by this name. You know, they simply repeat what he says and say more than he dares to say. That is fake news, complete lies, alternative facts. When they were trying to sell the judicial reform to the public, they openly and without any hesitation misrepresented the facts by calling the Supreme Court an extreme left institution or extreme liberal institution, same thing in Israeli discourse, by, by saying that the judges are only ruling in favor of the elites, by saying that in all other Western countries, politicians choose, elect the judges. Now, it's true that in many Western countries, including Germany, including Canada, politicians mostly or wholly elect the judges. But what the shofars have, have forgot to tell the public is that all these countries have other checks and balances on the politicians. Other countries have a written constitution, a very strong one here in Germany, a bill of rights. Other countries has, as in Germany, a two-cameral parliament that can also balance each other. We don't. We have a unicameral parliament. 
regional and elections or a federal structure. We don't have that. So we have no balances. That was the big mistake of the founding fathers and mothers, Ben Gurion and his generation, who did not create at least a written constitution and a Bill of Rights. But they did not because respect for the Supreme Court was so high and they thought that this and the basic laws would be enough. Mm. So a pack of lies is being sold to, especially to the more uh, believing base of, political base of Netanyahu, people who are less well educated, people who come from the periphery of Israeli society, who have their own angers and complaints, and who do not look into the little details, or the big details for the matter. And there is now also a television channel, Channel 14, that was commissioned as a channel dedicated to Jewish culture, but it turned itself into a news channel modeled on Fox News in the United States, except that they are much worse than Fox News, and they actually not only tell lies, <coughs> But they also call in broadcast to the microphone for violence against Arab Palestinians. Real violence against innocent people at the wake of terror attacks. Eradicate a village, they said the other day, on television, in a public channel, which is a show far for Netanyahu. Ten more minutes and now f maybe for the good news, if I may. Yeah. Because I no longer believe, this may sound bad, but listen, I no longer believe that Israeli democracy, oh, I love the rain, by the way, you know, back in Israel it's very hot now, <laughs> this is wonderful music to my ears. I no longer believe that Israeli democracy is as strong as I thought. It's either weaker than I thought, or perhaps it's stronger than I thought. It depends if you look at the government and the Knesset, or if you look at civil society. Because what has happened on the streets of Israel is no less than a miracle. And I'm a wholly secular person. I'm very, very Jewish. I make excellent chicken soup. But I'm a secular person. So I shouldn't believe in miracles, but I do believe in human miracles. I think that the establishment of the state of Israel was a miracle. I think that Zionism at its best, not at its worst, which is nationalistic, but at its best, which is humanist and cosmopolitan, was a miracle. And I believe that what's happening now on the streets and city squares of Israel is no less than a human miracle. We have been demonstrating every Saturday night and very often also on weekdays for the last 24 weeks. How much is this in months? Already close to six months. Close to six months. I was there from the very first demonstration under heavy rain in Tel Aviv. We were all standing under umbrellas and singing the national anthem. Because what this demonstration, what this protest movement has done, one of the most important things it has done, aside from slowing down and halting for a while the legislation, is to reclaim the basic symbols of the state. For years now, the right wing, the extreme right, has been telling us, you are not good enough Jews because you are secular and liberal, you are not patriotic Israelis because you love the Arabs, that is, you stand up for the rights of Palestinians and other minority groups. You are not good enough and the flag is ours, the national anthem is ours. What we did out in the streets in Tel Aviv, first under umbrellas in January and now under the blazing sun, is to reclaim the flag of Israel. This is the flag of the demonstration together, by the way, with the gay flag, with the LGBTQ flag. And also you can see here and there Palestinian flags. Not everybody is very happy, but they are part of the demonstration. The Palestinian flags too. And by the way, in Tel Aviv, I will tell you an anecdote. 
When we only began, there was a small group of Jews and Arabs standing with Palestine flags. And people kind of went around them. It was a bit embarrassing for ordinary mainstream Israelis to, to look closer. Now, this group has become part of the center of the demonstration and people stop by and talk and listen and argue the way it should be, the way it should be. We have also reclaimed the national anthem, Hatikva, the hope, which is very suitable for our purposes because it talks about the Jewish wish for liberty, for freedom. And we make it into not only a Jewish wish, but a human wish for civil liberty and for human freedom and equality. And we have the third symbol, much more than a symbol, the wonderful document called the Declaration of Independence, which brings, as I said before, the good aspects of Zionism into play very beautifully. The Declaration of Independence, which is a thoroughly liberal democratic document prepared by lawyers, many of them, by the way, Jews that came from Germany or were educated in German universities during the late uh, uh, Empire and the Weimar Republic. I wrote a paper about it years ago. These people came with the lessons of what happened in Germany and they created a liberal democratic structure, both for the Supreme Court, for the judiciary, and also they were the people who wrote the Declaration of Independence. The word democracy and the word enlightenment were there, by the way, in the draft, but Ben-Gurion created a new draft that does not include them, maybe because he thought that it is self-evident that the new state of Israel will be a liberal democracy. It does offer peace to Israel's neighbors. It does promise equal civil rights to the Arab minority in Israel and famously promises equal human rights to all citizens regardless of race, religion and sex. Today we would call it gender or gender orientation if you like. But we have this document. It is not an official legal document in Israel, but the court does use it. And we have been demonstrating with huge, huge, um, uh, I don't know even how to call it, scrolls of independence that is, are carried on the shoulders of young people. Uh, and maybe you saw the aerial photographs in which hundreds of thousands of people are marching with a scroll of independence on their shoulder. It brought tears to my eyes. And I can tell you that some of the right-wing politicians are already whispering about having to check whether they can cancel, annul the Declaration of Independence. Their lunacy, if you forgive me, has gone that far. Not that Israel ever lived exactly by its Declaration of Independence, but this was our moral horizon. And now we, the pro-democracy movement, have a moral horizon from the more humanist part of our ancestors, of Judaism and of Zionism. Judaism and Zionism have other, less liberal aspects, but we are deliberately choosing, picking out the more liberal aspects. And this is our agenda. This is our agenda. Maybe you will ask me questions about demography. Demography is not on our side, so I will relate to that perhaps in the question and answer session. I will emphasize that this is not a protest of the elite. It is far too large to be a protest of the elite. It is made of wonderful grassroots groups in almost every city and town in Israel and in villages and in kibbutzim, up and down the country, from the borders of Lebanon down to Eilat. Uh, I'm deeply involved because my, my husband is part of the law professor's uh, protest, and my son is the leader of the student protest. And he went down to Eilat 
the other day to, let, to give a speech at the Eilat demonstration, I suspect he also went swimming in the Red Sea. But that's all right, you can enjoy yourself when you go out to demonstrate. To conclude, I am awed, I am full of admiration by the number of our country women and country men who are out on the street fighting this good fight. It is a very dangerous moment. It is civil society against the state. Our friends, including governments, including the government of Germany, have to do the abs take the absolutely difficult state of supporting this time not the state of Israel, as it has always promised and committed to do, but the civil society of Israel, which is, I claim, the real Israel at the present moment. Uh, we will need help not only to, uh, to cancel, to annul this legislation program and to fight the illiberal laws, but also perhaps to write a constitutional document. We will need all the support we can. We want, we will insist, we will not give up on our basic demand for equality between Jews and Arabs, between men and women, between human beings as such. My heart goes out to the friends of Israel abroad. I know it's a very difficult and embarrassing and sensitive moment. Please know that we are grateful for your moral support, but we assume full responsibility for our future. There are tremendous energies out on the streets these months. These are the energies the German public does not seem to have when confronting the Alternative for Deutschland. You need these energies. We can also borrow some energies to you, if you like. 2023 may become a very significant year in Jewish history. I hope for the better and not for the worse. We are determined that the third temple, this is the third temple, will remain standing. It's been standing for 75 years now, but only in the form of a liberal democracy and only as a legitimate heir to the Jewish and the general enlightenment. Thank you very much. So thank you, Tanya, for this uh, impressive, enlightening and energetic uh, presentation. And I would suggest to start with uh, questions which relate to understanding what she has said. Also ich würde jetzt vorschlagen, dass wir mit Verständnisfragen beginnen, falls es das gibt. And then we could move on to ask questions and queries about this or that. Um, Find a race already the question of demography, or we could delve into constitution and other topics. So if you have any questions about something what you couldn't get, you couldn't understand, so please raise your hand and uh, speak into the microphone that Herman Kuhn will hand over to you. <laughs> As I understood, you would yeah, a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a Yes, so how can we accomplish a written constitution right now in Israel? And this is a very tricky thing because uh, society is divided so passionately now into different segments. Um, I believe that there are a few people in the right wing, maybe more than a few people, who are deeply worried about what's happening. I believe there are quite a few people in the ultra-Orthodox section of society, and I have some secret relations in the ultra-Orthodox cent of, uh, part of society, people who come to my home to speak, and their own friends back in Bnei Brak don't even know that they're coming to meet secular liberals, but they are because they're worried. I think that a coalition of the worried Israelis, of the true patriots, might stand a chance of offering, as I said, a small, a thin constitution. Not something big and inclusive, because there we will fall into too many pitholes. But a basic small constitution promising at least separation of powers, some checks and balances on legislation, and at least the right to equality. These basics, we believe, might draw enough agreement
to sit down and write a constitution, perhaps not under this government. Perhaps this government has to fall first. Yes. Auf Deutsch. Ja, äh, vielen Dank, dass Sie gekommen sind. Und ich wünschte, Sie hätten ein größeres Publikum vorgefunden. Ich habe leider heute erst davon erfahren, vielleicht ging es anderen auch so und dann ist es. Ja, ich habe ich kann es nicht hören. Bitte, 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 Muss ich nur, nur Fragen stellen? Nee. Ich habe mich erst mal herzlich bedankt, das ist auch schon mal was. Ne? So. Aber meine Frage ist folgende. Ich bin dankbar dafür, dass Sie hier sind und auch uns auffordern, Sie zu unterstützen. Und Sie suchen Unterstützung, das verstehe ich sehr gut und ich bin dabei. Aber was kann ich denn tun, wenn ich mir die Organisationen in Deutschland ansehe, so wie die deutsch-israelische Gesellschaft? Mhm oder den Zentralrat der deutschen Juden. Ich habe bisher nichts gelesen darüber, dass die Position dazu beziehen. Mhm. Ja, ich habe... Ja, Antworten, glaube ich, ne? Ja, ja. ja, 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 ja man will, Sie sollen auch antworten, aber ich will antworten, dass es nicht an uns liegt, wenn Sie dazu noch nichts gelesen haben, weil wir haben schon im Dezember, als die Pläne öffentlich wurden und dann später nochmal im März hier von der Deutsch-Israelischen Gesellschaft in Bremen eine ausführliche Stellungnahme der völligen Unterstützung der Demokratiebewegung verabschiedet, äh, auch unter unseren, äh, unseren Rundbrief bekannt gemacht. Womit Sie recht haben, ist, dass es in der DIG auch andere Meinungen gibt. Es gibt die Meinung, das geht uns nichts an. Also wir wir sollten uns nicht einmischen. Das sind innerisraelische Angelegenheiten. Das ist eine Minderheit, aber diese Meinung gibt es. Wir in Bremen machen das seit Wochen, was Frau Os Salzberger einfordert, nämlich um Unterstützung zu werben. Und auf allen drei Veranstaltungen, die wir gemacht haben, zu 75 Jahre Israel, haben wir eingangs die Unabhängigkeitserklärung in großen Auszügen zitiert. Weil wir, ja, weil wir äh, das Gefühl haben, dass das das Argument und das äh, Dokument ist, auf dem man sich wieder besinnen und beziehen kann. Mhm. Also Ihre Frage, von mir aus gesehen, wir haben uns klar positioniert. Äh, wenn Sie äh, Interesse haben, nehmen Sie auch gerne unseren Rundbrief auf, dann kriegen Sie das vielleicht auch schneller. Aber äh, Frau Salzberger will vielleicht auch noch mal darauf antworten. Thank you both for, for the question and for the input. Yes. Es funktioniert nicht. Es geht nur für die Aufnahme, nicht für uns. Yes. Have you seen the statement of the deutsch-israelische Gesellschaft? And do you think that the message has arrived and understood, been understood in Jerusalem? Yes. Well, we have heard from uh, Jewish organizations, not only in Germany, but also in the United States and in Britain and France and other places. And these include not just the left-leaning liberal Jewish organizations, but also the more mainstream or right-leaning Jewish organizations have said their word. But I have to say that we in Israel, uh, grateful as we are for the support of Jewish organizations, we need support beyond the Jewish organizations. I would not like people in the world to think that this is a Jewish problem, so why don't the Jewish organizations deal with it? This is, of course, this is not what you meant at all, but it can be uh, misleading. This is a problem not of Jews, but of every democratic citizen in the world. And I would like to see you approaching your government, which has also spoken out politely, you know, quite politely, uh, and a little weakly, perhaps. But I'll give you one example. I'll give you one direction. Very soon the Knesset will wish to legislate, and it's already in preparation, a law against money coming from foreign governments to Israeli civil and Palestinian civil society organizations. So the political uh, foundations, the Heinrich Böll Stiftung and the others, uh, who are doing great work in Israel, and I've been collaborating with many of them in events and, and meetings and Jewish Arab meetings and so on, 
uh, will not be able to conduct their work anymore, which is absurd because uh, the Netanyahu people are getting a lot of money from private foundations. There is a foundation in the United States and it's supporting the extreme libertarian think tank that put together the judicial uh, legislation, the judicial overall. They can get money from private dubious billionaires, but we cannot get, or we will not be able to get German government money for the good causes of liberal democracy. This is where German citizens, Jewish and non-Jewish, not as a Jewish issue at all, should approach their government and say enough is enough. If this law is passed, there should be sanctions against the government of Israel. Not sanctions that would injure or hurt the public, definitely not the Jews and Palestinians who are working together and other good causes in civil society, but something that would make Netanyahu very uncomfortable. And the fact that he is not being invited to Berlin is a good start. Make sure that he is not invited to Berlin in this term until uh, things uh, until the, the uh, judicial overall is off the table completely. So it is between you and your own government in a way that the best support for us can be given. And of course, any message of support to the people out of the on the streets. And by the way, the police, depending where, depending if the local commander of the police loves violence and is pro Netanyahu or not, people are dragged into arrest and people are held in police stations overnight, and we come outside the police stations and cheer them up. If you could send cheering messages to these brave demonstrators, it would be a lot. It would be a lot. So this is what I mean by your support. But as I said, the responsibility for our future is, after all, ours. Bevor die nächste Wortmeldung dann kommt, will ich das ergänzen. Als die Pläne für dieses Gesetz was die Arbeit von Nicht-Regierungsorganisationen äh, stark erschweren würde, haben wir sofort eine öffentliche Pressemitteilung gemacht. Wir haben darüber auch mit der Bundesregierung gesprochen, das darf ich hier sagen. Äh, und wir wissen auch, dass die Bundesregierung mit dazu beigetragen hat, dass dieses Gesetz noch nicht äh, in die Gesetzgebung gekommen ist. Und Herr Seibert zum Beispiel wird dafür von den Rechten in Israel scharf kritisiert und zwar öffentlich kritisiert. Also äh, es ist mit Sicherheit nicht genug und äh, über solche konkreten Aktionen für einzelne Leute, die verfolgt werden, muss man nochmal reden. Äh, aber äh, ich möchte doch sagen, dass wir hier, obwohl es unterschiedliche Meinungen gibt, äh, klar und eindeutig auf der Seite der Demokratiebewegung sind und vielleicht ein bisschen auch äh, erreichen. Herr Zimmer. Ich gehe mal jetzt weiter und dann... Ja. Ja. ja, ich muss leider auch in Deutsch fragen, weil mein Englisch okay. nicht genug ist. Ich hätte drei Fragen. Also einmal spielen die Gewerkschaften in Israel dort eine Rolle in der Demokratiebewegung und, und dementsprechend auch die soziale Frage, weil es ja auch große Demonstrationen deswegen gab in der Vergangenheit. Eine zweite Frage wäre, wie verhält sich die äh, muslimische Bevölkerung in, in, in Israel, also die Bevölkerung in Nazar, sind die, sind die Teil der Bewegung? Also Sie berichteten ja von dieser Gruppe mit der palästinensischen Fahne. Ist das jetzt nur ein einziges Beispiel oder sonst wächst da was zusammen? Und eine dritte Frage wäre, wie ist eigentlich die Situation in den Siedlungen? Also in Ariel gibt es dort auch Demonstrationen, beteiligen sich die Menschen dort an der Demokratiebewegung oder wie ist die Situation dort? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for very good questions. I will try to be brief because we have other questions coming. Uh, first of all, with regard to the trade unions, Yes, is that the first question, right? Uh, or the worker unions. We have, as you know, in Israel a roof a union that uh, encompasses all of them, the Histadrut. And so far the Histadrut, because its head is a Netanyahu appointment, <coughs> has been a little weak to respond. But there was one moment, one very dramatic day in March, when Netanyahu decided to sack to fire the defense minister, Yoav Gallant, for being too liberal lefty. And uh, Israelis said enough was enough. It was announced in the evening. I remember it on a Thursday. My husband and I were already in bed. I'm getting to the trade union, don't worry. <laughs> uh, we got up, we dressed, and we went out to demonstrate, and so did thousands of other Israelis. The next day, in the morning, the Histadrut announced a one-day strike. 
And the one day strike, that meant a general strike in Israel, including the education system. And one day was enough for Netanyahu to withdraw the sacking of the Minister of Defense. So, so far, the power of the trade union has not yet been unleashed, except in that particular moment. But this is one of our doomsday weapons. You know, and we believe that despite the fact that there is some Netanyahu leaning leadership in the Histadrut right now, uh, we believe that the majority there would agree to strike if the legislation begins to be passed. So this is with regard to the uh, Gewerkschaften. The Muslims or the whole Arab population in Israel, Arab and Druze, uh, Druze, not Jews, uh, we have the 20%, 18 to 20% uh, of these uh, minority groups are not enough, not present enough in the demonstrations, although it depends where. Uh, I, uh, we make very, very uh, sure that we have uh, speech makers, speakers in the demonstrations who are both Jewish and Arab in many places. And when I spoke in the Galilee in several places where there is a strong Arab uh, community, there were also Arabs among the demonstrators. Men and women, lawyers, students, more educated people uh, who understand the situation. But a lot of other Arab intellectuals and leaders are saying, oh, this is not our fight. We have our own problems. This is an inter-Jewish, inner-Jewish conflict. Let them play it out. We are out of it. And we tell them that they are wrong. We tell them that they are simply wrong because they, their people, would be the first victims of this process. And already there is a rise in racist behavior, and not only racist behavior, you've seen what's going on in the West Bank in recent days, with the army trigger happy and, and, and killing civilians when they try to catch terrorists. And then a terror attack, a terrible terror attack of Palestinians against Jews, followed by Jews, unbelievably, hundreds of settlers coming at night to an Arab villages and, and, and village and burning houses and cars. Very luckily, nobody was killed. People were injured. This is horrible. Within Israel, racism against Arab citizens is growing they will have to realize they cannot sit on the fence, they must join us. And I think some of them are beginning to realize this. As to the settlers themselves, your third question, they are not made of one skin, there are more moderate elements. I am in touch also with people from the settlements who are willing to conduct a dialogue. Some of them have very interesting ideas, some of them declare themselves to be humanist and liberal and they think that maybe a one-state solution would be a good compromise or some kind of a federal compromise. These are people I can talk with. And we already have in several settlements of the more moderate kind, pro-democracy demonstrations, which we find very encouraging. So whoever meets the basic demand of being a, a human being, and believing in civil rights and human rights equality is welcome to join the democracy protest. Thank you again for the questions. Ja. Sie haben ja dargestellt, dass die israelische Gesellschaft gespalten ist, und zwar gründlich gespalten. Und auf der einen Seite haben Sie unterschieden säkulare und religiöse, und auf der anderen Seite äh, liberale und nationalistische. Äh, ist das ein Zufall, dass diese beiden Gruppen sozusagen sich genauso äh, auf diese Weise spalten? Also gibt es keine äh, säkularen Religiösen und keine religiösen Humanisten sozusagen mehr? Oh, absolut. Ja, you, you are absolutely ist das right. Ist das die Frage? Yes, unfortunately, there are too few liberals in the nationalist camp and too few liberals in the ultra-orthodox camp, although there are some. So, of course, there are, there are exceptions, there are overlaps. We are working with groups that in some ways believe very different 
in very different principles from us, but are willing to work with us on liberal democracy. So yes, it is not a completely you know, black and white situation. On this, the question is a very good question because you have a point. But unfortunately, you know, uh, it does happen, and I will be very clear about it, that the better educated people are, the more able they are to understand complexity. The more able they are to understand abstract principles. And the Israeli education system, of course the ultra-Orthodox don't even teach these subjects, but the Israeli general education system has been too weak on civic issues. Too weak on drawing the right historical lessons, for example. You know, we all know the historical lesson of the Holocaust, that Jews must never be again in a position of defenseless victims. This is a conclusion everybody draws, especially the right wing. But the other lessons about preserving democracy against its enemies, this is where the more educated you are, the more you understand. And unfortunately, the division within Israel society is not only along the lines that I mentioned before, and there are overlaps, as you say, but it is also along the lines of the more educated, the better educated, and the lesser educated. And this is wrong, and this is a big mistake of generations of Israeli people who did not give enough attention to democratic education. The lesson that Germany has learned so well, and this house that we are sitting in is a result of that lesson, Israel still has to learn, learn much more powerfully. So I would like to ask you a Please. few queries and questions because they perfectly match with uh, what Bernd has said. Because you mentioned earlier that there were interesting noises from the ultra-Orthodox sector. Yes. And I would like to ask you to elaborate on that a bit and also maybe connecting that to what you mentioned, the issue of demography, that it's somehow working against democratic values. So could you elaborate on that a bit? Then as a second question, I would like to ask you about the interplay between political opposition, so parties, and the civil society, because you mainly focused on the civil society, mm -hmm. but you didn't tell us so much about what the opposition parties do in this whole process. Thank you for the questions. Sure. We have at least another question here. We will take it too. I hope we have enough time. We will have it. But again, no worries. Uh, <laughs> uh, we so when the rain stops, so it will stop tomorrow. <laughs> so no worries. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. So the first question about the ultra orthodox. This is very very interesting. Of course, there are several big ultra orthodox communities in Israel belonging to two main ultra orthodox streams. I don't know if you uh, are into. The details, there is the uh, Hasidic stream, which has a certain type of charismatic leadership, and the more intellectually in inclined Lita'im, Lithuanians as we call them, uh, not, n no longer anything to do with the Lithuania, but they used to come from there, uh, more rationalist. Uh, but basically what they agree upon, what their leaders have agreed upon, is that they are some kind of an autonomous, autonomous entity within Israeli society, living within their own walls. They are walled communities, if you like. And as I said before, uh, large families, an education which is totally Torah and Talmud orientated, and the biggest mistake of Israeli leaders in the past, not, excuse me, enforcing upon them the core curriculum. At least the sciences, mathematics, languages, some knowledge of the world. The uh, level of ignorance there is staggering, and these are very intelligent people. Very intelligent, because when you study the Talmud, uh, you do intelligent things there, with your mind. But they live, as I said, in an, a parallel universe to us. But many of their younger people, and some women are beginning to make different noises. There is at least one, and I think more than one, women's organization within the ultra-Orthodox community demanding women's right when it comes to, to marriage and to divorce and to domestic issues. All this was kept under the carpet for many years, now it's out in the open. 
I follow almost every day some of the ultra-Orthodox websites. In the beginning, they tried to fight the internet completely. And the rabbi said, no smartphones and no web. But internet was too strong. And it entered the walls of Neibrak and Measha Arim like microwave, you know. Uh, and now, uh, famously, many ultra-Orthodox people have two telephones. One is the kosher telephone to show the rabbi, and the other is the smartphone in which I can, you know, surf the internet a little bit. So they see the world. They also look around and they see how men and women behave elsewhere. And I still predict an ultra-Orthodox spring in Israel. I've been predicting it for the last 10 years. It might take time. <laughs> but you can see the noises coming. You can feel the tectonic plates changing. And especially young people are now much more interested in society and in politics. Some of our most intelligent journalists and media people come from the ultra-Orthodox community and they manage to live in both communities. The women are much more into, first of all, sorry to say fashion. They've become much more fashionable because they watch and see what women are wearing and they, they adapt it to the ultra-Orthodox code. But also more women are interested in politics and more women write in the ultra-Orthodox websites, which is a kind of a rise, a development which I find truly interesting. Give them another generation or so, and who knows, they might cross the Rubicon between Bnei Brak and Tel Aviv. It's not called the Rubicon, it's called the Ayalon River, but it's the same thing. So demography is not on our side, you're absolutely right. Uh, but I think that there are a lot of people who are likely to join mainstream society from the ultra-Orthodox communities. And then there, with a little luck, they will not join as ultra-nationalists, but as liberal democrats. Mm -hmm. Your second question was? It was about the interplay between political opposition and civil society. Yes, I'll be very brief there. The parties, the center-left parties have shown weakness and lack of leadership. I would say ever since Rabin was assassinated, he was our natural charismatic leader. We didn't have another one. Barak was not a bad leader, but he lost the elections. And ever since that time, we do not have a natural leader in the center left. I wish I could tell you that a new Zelensky is growing up or a new Rabin is growing up within the Israeli left and center parties, but so far they've been in disarray. Gantz and Lapid are decent human beings. I know them both. I'm in touch with them. They mean well. I believe that they are genuine liberals and genuine Democrats, but they are not strong enough to stand up to the smearing campaign against them and the left that Netanyahu is orchestrating. So the responses are always too weak. And this is why, this is another reason why the civil protest is so powerful. Because the charisma that we are lacking in the Knesset has appeared on the streets. And some leaders are already growing up from the civil movement, from the pro-democracy protest, who are likely to go into politics with all the problems of politicizing, of course. It's never easy for protest leaders to become politicians. I don't have to tell you that because you know, but sometimes it works. And I'm hoping that a new generation of political leaders, especially young ones, women and men, there are some very strong women leading the protest, will emerge. So hopefully we are getting there. But right now, our general feeling towards our own politician is meh, they're too weak, they're too soft. They're not serious. So several springs to come. For Hopefully, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've been well, offered, yes, but I'm not made of political materials, I'm yeah, afraid. I'm an academic, yes. Mm. Yes, please. Yeah, eine Frage, die vielleicht gar nicht so zu beantworten ist, aber ich überlege die ganze Zeit, wie schätzen Sie das Verhältnis ein jetzt dieser zivilgesellschaftlichen, starken Opposition zu dieser in Opposition zu dieser Regierung, dieser rechtsnationalistischen, ja, vielleicht zum rechtsextremistischen Regierung, wie kann das weitergehen? Also mir ist im Augenblick nicht klar, welche Perspektive äh, jetzt 
sich schon eröffnet für den Protest, also ist ja mehr als Protest, also mhm. für, für das Verfassen einer Verfassung, für die Konsolidierung dieser Bewegung mit eventuell charismatischen Führern und so weiter und so weiter. Wie ist das einzuschätzen? Ich kann es im Augenblick überhaupt noch nicht. Ja, auch aus dem, was war hochinteressant, was Sie im Einzelnen alles gesagt haben, aber ich kann daraus noch nicht einschätzen, wie wird das sich entwickeln. Wer gewinnt, Fania? Wer gewinnt? Yes, I was going to say, you know. <laughs> it's a very good question. Uh, I, I, it's very difficult to give a prognosis now because the situation is still very raw, very fresh, uh, changing all the time. But I will say this on behalf of my friends in the in the resistance, in the protest movement. We have to talk to the hearts of the soft right wingers. But as to the extreme right, we have to win. We have to win. They are not partners. They are not legitimate partners. They should not be in the government of Israel. We have to kick these people back into the holes from which they crawled. And I'm sorry I'm being tough here, but they deserve it, believe me. <laughs> Yes, so there's food waiting, so please ask the questions now. <laughs> yes. yes. I've been in Israel uh, in May and uh, I've, I've got a lot of friends there. Um, and I was told and I learned that many of them plan to, uh, left, to leave the country. And uh, what about this issue? They uh, prognose that when the school ends, uh, many of uh, uh, educated people are going to leave the country because they are too scared, too uh, worried about everything and they, they want to save their... Um, to save their children. Yes. Yes. Well, there is, there has been talk about leaving the country. I also, you know, have friends who talk about this. They buy uh, houses in Portugal. They look for jobs in the United States. Uh, there is talk. What I find quite amazing is that since the rise of the protest movement, you don't hear that much talk about leaving Israel. Uh, there was more of it in January and February. And of course, people still talk, especially in Tel Aviv. But first of all, suppose there are three million liberal democratic Israelis. Who will take us? Who will take us? There are too many of us. <laughs> I'm an older person, you know, my friends, you know, I, I can't look for a job elsewhere now. Uh, so, of course, for young high-tech quizzes, it's easier to, to move to another country. But remember, we are not members of the EU. I wish we were members of the, at least of the European Council, then we would be subject to the European Court of Law. It would have changed things. And uh, I do not anticipate mass immigration, emigration from Israel. I think most of us are... If anything, we are strengthened, we are heartened by the pro-democracy movement. You know, when I go out on the streets in Tel Aviv or in my hometown of Zichon Yaakov or up in the Galilee and I meet these people in the demonstrations, these are the people I want to live with. With all due respect to Germany and to Portugal and to the Silicon Valley. And, uh, these are the people, these are my people. And we are very like-minded in our values and we discovered one another in these demonstrations. So yes, some people are talking about emigrating, but I believe that unless a ca true catastrophe befalls us like an active civil war, right now we have a, a passive civil war, but an active civil war, things might change. But so far we are holding on and our temperament is more in the direction of fighting it out than leaving the game altogether. Thank you. Any other arguments, questions, disputes? Obviously not, so that's... Obviously not, and I hope that you share my hope for the future. Thank you, thank you.